Welcome to Air Checks. As a tribute of Douglas Adams, we are going to present the first series of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency that was created posthumously in 2007 as directed by Dirk Maggs. I am sorry, I do not have the second series. Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency is a humorous detective novel by English writer Douglas Adams, published in 1987. It is described by the author on its cover as a thumping good detective ghost horror who done it time travel romantic musical comedy epic. The book was followed by a sequel, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. The recurring major characters are the eponymous Dirk Gently, his secretary Janice Pierce and Sergeant Gilks. Adams began work on another novel, The Salmon of Doubt, with the intention of publishing it as the third book in the series, but died before completing it. A BBC Radio 4 adaptation of six episodes was broadcast from October 2007. A second series based on the sequel was broadcast from October 2008. A 2010 television adaptation for BBC4 borrowed some of the characters and some minor plot elements of the novel to create a new story, and a 2016 television adaptation for BBC America served as a continuation of the books. Here's the first episode as it was broadcasted on October 3, 2007 on BBC4. Dirk gently discovers that Richard Macduff is not himself. Gordon Way has a permanent out-of-the-body experience. <laughs> Centibyte 42 decimal. Are the landing craft systems back online? Overload, overload. I believe so, Chief Engineer. Are the damping breakers set to automatic? Overload, overload. Would you like them to be? Yes, of course. Then they are. Overload, overload. Fuel line safety switches on. Orbital thrusters primed. Pressure seal repairs holding. Overload, overload. Is that what you would like? Would I be asking if I didn't? Overload, overload. Then they are most satisfactory. Come aboard and strap in. Overload, overload. Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. We solve the whole crime. We find the whole person. Or cat. Put some life into it. Please leave a message after the pretentious whale song. Happy? Gently, it's Gordon Way. And I'm still waiting to hear from you. I need an update tonight or I'm taking the job elsewhere. But get out with a pair of binoculars or something. Run a wiretap, but get on with it. And get back to me. I don't care how late. I must know what's going on. Meow. It's BBC 
economics editor. Take this evidence. Well, it's the pump on with you. That's my culture chef. Complete loony. Hanging around here to the forecourt. Sort of long brown hoodie. Funny voice singing to himself something about believing. His mother. Can't see him now. Yeah. Got to go. Oh, man, 240 quid, there's a card. Gee way, Esquire. It is you. Right do I hope so. On TV, you're in. God, I need a haircut. Pin number? President Kennedy Jr. It's P-I-N, you don't need the number. What do you do on this system? Here's our ecological affairs correspondent, Jeremy Clarkson. Bapsy? Keep it. Hello? Your boot's unlocked. Hey. Car boot, not shut. Ah, right. Should be more careful. Shotguns. Business meeting, is it? <laughs> Come on, sis. Hi, this is Susan Way. I'm out scraping a living or spending it, so talk after the beep. Susan, hi, it's Gordon, 9pm Thursday on my way over to the cottage. Listen, got the Californians over for the weekend to thrash out this software deal, and look, I hate to ask you this sort of thing, but can you have a word with Richard? I just need to know that he's working on Anthem 2. I mean, really working on it. Every time I see his computer screen, he's got a picture of a sofa spinning on it, and I'm not paying him for... Oh, that was bright! Sodding lorries! Never dip them properly. Lucky I didn't end up in a ditch. That would be something, wouldn't it? Leaving your famous last words on an answering machine. Hold on a sec, Susan. I think I've got a noise in the boot. No. Nah. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Lorries. Light-activated dipper switches. Yes. The Department of the Environment owes me a favor. We've got the technology if they've got the legislation. What's the point of a CBE if you can't kick a little ass? <laughs> you can tell I've been talking to Americans all week. I've got a boot full of shotguns. See the lengths I go to to make them feel at home. What is this obsession they have for shooting my rabbits? Ah, sorry, I'll have to pull over and see to the boot. I'll be a sec. Hang on. K for a car you wouldn't believe. I believe I'm instructed to shoot off. Susan, it's me. Susan, it's Richard. What a mess. Look, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I know I promised to take you to the Cole Reed's dinner tonight, but I completely forgot, and I feel really bad. <sighs> Look, we'll go away, this weekend. Doesn't matter what pressure your brother tries to put on me, we'll do it. Gordon will just have to... Gordon! Gordon? I I'll call you back. Gordon? Hello? Oh, great. Do you make a habit of parking your car on a blind bend, sir? Uh, no, officer, sorry. I had to stop to avoid my employer. I thought I saw him throw himself in front of the car, shaking his finger at me. Been drinking, sir? No. Yes, <laughs> but very little. Glass of wine. Small port. Formal dinner. My old college at Cambridge. I'm open university myself. Didn't have old colleges. Just a post office box in Milton Keynes. Right. Name? Richard Macduff. Macduff. And who is this employer? His name is Way. Gordon Way. I design software for him. For Way Forward Technologies. Mm. We've got one of his computers down the station. The Quark 2. Look at if I can get it to work. It doesn't work. Never has done. You could use it as a paperweight. I don't think that's a clever idea, sir. The door will blow open. Well, the Have a response. Gunfire heard one mile east of Elmden. Abandoned vehicle off carriageway. Go Foxtrot Control. It's DS Jilks. I'm in Elmden. Two minutes. Roger there, Sarge. Control now. Uh, my advice to you, sir, go nice and easy on the way back. Lock up your car and spend the weekend getting completely pissed. I find it's the only way. <laughs> yeah, wish I could. I've got so much work to do this weekend, I'm already hallucinating. Well, drive safely. What the hell was I thinking? I can't possibly promise Susan the weekend, but I can't take it back. It's on her answering machine. If I screw up again, I'm finished. Ten o'clock. Do I have a choice?
Time, 23.45 hours. Location, rooftop, Islington. Observing Susan Way's flat. Weather, cold. Tea? Colder. Sandwich? Warm. Can I go home now? It's been three hours since that message and nothing's happening. There's no substitute for good, honest detectiving, Miss Pierce. Heat-seeking binoculars, good vantage point, loyal assistant. I must be mad, climbing up here in the middle of the night. But a very important, and don't forget, rich client. Shh! I'm so cold. I think they're coming back from their date. And hungry. No, that's not from inside her flat. I've got a last train to catch. I am not missing that. And bowling. Oh, hey, focus, focus. Yes, do we spy a burglary in progress? Take this down. Burglar is male, slim, 30s, dark clothing, scaling the rear of apartments where client's sister lives. No, no, stop. It isn't a burglar. Good, because your pen just ran out. It's Richard Macduff. The bloke we're waiting for? Isn't he supposed to be on the date with Susan Way? In which case, who is? You're the detective. Miss Pierce, only an holistic detective can end up in the right place at the right time for what on the face of it are all the wrong reasons. Besides which, I can't find Mrs. Sorskin's cat and keep tabs on Richard Macduff's extracurriculars. Look at him. This is a man in the grip of something greater than passion. In Xanadu, did Kubla Khan... In Islington, did Richard Macduff, a stately pleasure dome, climb up the back of... Susan Way has carelessly left the window unlocked, thus proving holistic nature of coincidence and, coincidentally, the sheer blind luck of Richard Macduff. I'm not writing any of this down, you know. Well, remember it and write it up tomorrow. You mean, like, at midnight, subject finally disappeared inside client's sister's flat. How do you know the time? I can see them chucking out at the Rose and Crown. They've had last orders, and so have you. Good night. I'll expect to see this overtime in my wages. I told you, I'm waiting for a cheque. Well, I'm not. Oh, goodness. Simply can't get the staff these days. Right. Light switch. Damn. Damn. On the sideboard. Under the sideboard. Answering machine. Where would you keep that old thing? Yes. You beauty. Pretty fool. Maybe the tape ran out before I rang. Susan, hi, it's Gordon. Can you have a word with Richard? I just need to know that he's working on Anthem 2. I Give mean, a rest, really Gordon. working on it. Leaving your famous last words on an answering machine. Gordon lost for words. That's a first. Susan, it's Richard. What a mess. Look, I... Gotcha! <laughs> Hello? Ah, damn! Rule one in housebreaking. Never answer the phone. Who is this? Neighbourhood watch. Look out of the window. Is that you? D waving from the warehouse roof? Smile. Rule two. Never show your face where you can be photographed. God. Rule three. Are you listening, Richard Macduff? Yes, but how do you... Please never admit your name. But what... Now you're picking it up, though not impressively. A fast learner would have hung up by now, but... What? what do you want? The more interesting question is, what do you want? What? Why does Richard Macduff, a relatively successful software developer, decide to become a burglar? Uh, you... And why is he burgling the flat of Susan Way, sister of the famous Gordon Way, for whom he does freelance work? Who the hell are you? Gently. Sorry, who the hell are you? Dirk, gently. Ring a bell? Dirk, gently, from college. Ding dong. Look, Dirk, I forgot to take her out with me this evening. To make up for it, I left a message promising to take her away for the weekend, but I can't possibly go, so I need to get rid of the message before she hears it and dumps me for good, OK? Really? I have a feeling there's more. Well, there isn't. Then I bid you good evening. Good night. However, when you change your mind, I'll be at the Late Late Pizza on Upper Street. Come alone and bring money. Are you trying to blackmail me? No, you nincompoop, for the pizzas. <gasps> Susan, what to do? No, put it back. Face the music. All square. Ah, flowers. No vase. No time. Look as if you're meant to be here. Ah, sofa. That's what I'm good for, really. But Duff. Wednesday week, what a surprise. My name is Wenton Weeks, actually. Old habits. 
God, it's suddenly very cold in here. Richard! Oh, well, Susan, it seems that we are... <coughs> Ooh. I've been saving that up all evening. Look, flowers. Ah, these are familiar. Did you break my vase? <laughs> of course you did. I can see the wreckage under the sideboard. Excuse me for a moment, Michael. What? Uh, oh, yes, sure. Um, I was, um, well, we've just been... Couldn't care less, actually, Michael. No, absolutely. You're cross with me, aren't you? Going out for dinner with your girlfriend and all that. Well, I mean, she rang me, actually. Michael, get real. You've never liked me, have you? You think I'm odd. Admit it. Hey, look. A lot of people get professional help, actually. Excuse me? But you try convincing people that you're better. Can we go back a couple of quantum leaps? Nobody will believe me. Except the monk, of course. The monk? You've heard about the monk? The monk. <laughs> Susan? Oh, is that the time? It is what the time. Michael, thanks again. Lovely yes. evening. Super meal. Yes, lovely. Mm -hmm. yes, I, actually, I was wondering if... Michael it... Dorr? Uh, yes, right. <laughs> Bye then. Good luck with the um, treatment. Look, what can I see? You could have showed some pain when I gave you my best slap. Oh, God, it's freezing in here. Why is the window wide open? Well, uh, that's how I get in. What on earth possessed you to do that? You took your key back, remember? <sighs> Here, if it's, if it's going to save your life, just don't start raiding my fridge again. You could move back into our flat. And clamber over that sofa every time I want to use the stairs. I suppose it would be pointless saying I'm sorry at this point. It's pointless at any point. This is behaviour a bout of amoebic dysentery would be ashamed of. I bet even the lowest form of virus shows up to take its girlfriend out for a trot round the stomach lining once in a while. I hope you had a lousy evening at your stupid college. I did. You wouldn't have liked it. It started badly, then got worse. Yes, yes, all right. Professor Cronotis? The, oh, oh, it's you. Oh, what is it now, emotional problems? No, no, Professor. I'm Macduff. Richard Macduff? I know. I left about ten years ago, so... Well, I'm afraid you're well out of my care, then. Off you go, and uh, you can take your drugs with you. I'm here for the dinner. You invited me. It's tonight. Oh, oh, my dear fellow. I just... <laughs> Why didn't you say we're late? Now, now, come, come, come. It wouldn't do to Miss Grace. <sighs> High table, two Christum seats, Domino next Domino. to the Don, the flaky Amen. scalp. Amen. Right. No idea what all this is about, by the way. I mean, all, all the candles and silver and business generally means a special dinner in honour of something no one can remember yeah. anything about. Well, I'm just touched that you remember me, Professor Cronotis. Oh, please, call me Reg. So much shorter than Regis, Professor of Chronology. <laughs> well, I remember you very well, I think. Did I ever explain exactly what the Regis Professorship of Chronology did? Go on. Well, the chair was originally instituted by King George III, who was, as you know, well... Mad? Yeah, as a box of frogs, and simply obsessed with time. Every palace filled with clocks. God save the king! God save the king! Yes, yes, bless, bless... What's the time, um, thing of me? Eleven and fifty-six minutes off the forenoon, sir. One of my favourites. Uh, this morning, we had occasion to spend some time in Windsor Great Park, walking among the splendid oak trees, one of which, as many of you will know, is married to our esteemed cousin, Frederick of Prussia. Uh, suffice it to say that we had a most elevating discourse on the nature of time, which, we might add, was of considerable interest to His Excellency, the French Ambassador, who has taken up residence in the left-hand pocket of our breeches, confounded fellow. <coughs> Your Majesty... There is no need to whisper, he's asleep. And so, concerned as we are to ensure the passage of time continues forward, the reverse of which, even for a moment, would be of the utmost calamity, we hereby bestow upon our University of Cambridge the chair of Professor of Chronology. And God bless all who sit in her. The purpose of said professor shall be to answer the following questions. First... 
to investigate whether there is any scientific reason why one thing happens after another. Secondly, to determine if there is any risk of it stopping. And thirdly, of course... Oh, dear. Uh, is it still 11.56? It is almost noon. Oh, we shall come on. Oh, run. Run, 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 run. Since the answers to the king's questions were clearly yes, no, and maybe, I realised I could then take the rest of my career off. And your predecessors? Oh, were much of the same mind. But the king had three questions. Oh, enough history. Who was that friend of yours when you were here? Uh, do you ever see him? Hmm? A chap with an odd East European name? Uh, Svlad something? Svlad Jelly. Dirk Gently, as he is now. Ah. No, I never stayed in touch. Why do you ask? Um... Oh, no reason. <laughs> uh, what about you? Hmm? I, I gather you've suddenly done very well for yourself at last. Hmm? Uh, well, yes, in fact. Y young Macduff here is in computers. Why? It's, oh, dear. Obviously not a subject fit for such a glittering occasion. Uh, Corley, w w what's all this about? This is candles and silver nonsense? Coleridge. It's the Coleridge dinner, you old fool. Ah, did you hear that, Macduff? It's the Coleridge dinner. He was a member of the college, you know, Coleridge. Samuel T. Poet? Yes. I expect you've heard of him. This is his dinner. Well, not literally. It would be cold by now. <laughs> to cap everything, he had a horse in his bathroom. And I know you hate that kind of thing. Susan? Susan. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Listen... You must tell me this again, when I'm interested. Susan, what can I do? Anything. Dinner at mine? Oh, you'll need to get rid of that sofa on your stairs. Then I'd feel more like coming round. Ah, yes, this sofa. It's stuck. I like this relationship going nowhere. Upended. Well and truly stuffed. Mm, bit harsh. Look, oh, I'm too tired to be angry anymore. An evening of being lobbied by Michael Wendon Wearisome has taken it out of me. <laughs> He's obsessed with the idea that I can do something to stop Gordon buying up his magazine, whatever it's called. You mean Fathom? Fathom. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, I'm glad you had a lousy evening. I want to talk about what we're going to do this weekend. Ah. Oh, I better just check the messages first. Ah, uh, well. <sighs> Susan, hi, it's Gordon. Actually, I can't be bothered. It'll just be full of things he wants me to pass on to his secretary. Here, could you just keep this tape to her when you go in tomorrow? Save me a trip? Uh Absolutely. Now, the weekend. Susan. I'm afraid I've got to work. Nicola's sick and I'm going to have to debt for her at the Wigmore on Friday week. That means a lot of extra cello practice this weekend, I'm afraid. Sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> well, in fact, I should do some work too. I know. Gordon keeps on at me to nag you. Oh, I wish he wouldn't. Well, I'm sure that there's some kind of grey area between being pressurised and being completely forgotten about that I'd quite like to explore. Mm. Give me a hug. Yeah. I think I can do that. Ingrid says I can earn more an hour cold calling grannies, Dirk vlogging them bars with a door in. And they don't leak. You spend a fortune on some brass plaque at the front door when we get no customers, and all the time when it's raining, this roof is whittling into my tippex. Which is another thing. The digital highway certainly took a detour around this office. Excuse me for one moment. Uh, I'm on the phone to a client, Miss Pierce. Oh, I was. They've hung up. Ah, hello. Yes. Are you Dominic? Uh, French license, third floor? Take a wild guess. Ah, excellent. Because I'm actually looking for the detective agency. Yeah, and? And is Mr Gently in? Yes. Good. Or no... I am not in a position to say. His whereabouts are, as of now, entirely his own business. Are you his secretary? I am Janice Pierce, his ex-secretary. A deliriously satisfying state I intend to maintain. If he spends his money on expensive brass plaques rather than on his staff, then let him. Good for business, my ass. Answering the phones properly is good for business, and I'd like to see his fancy brass plaque do that. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to storm out, please. Oh, feel free. For once I do! Dirk Gently, solicit... Hello? Hello? Dirk. Uh, 
I'm very glad you asked me that, Mrs. Wallington. The term holistic refers to my conviction that what we're concerned with is the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. With you in a pico second. I see the solution to each problem as being detectable within the pattern and web of the whole, Mrs. Rawlinson. Let me give you an example. If you go to an acupuncturist with toothache, he sticks a needle into your thigh. Do you know why he does that, Mrs. Rawlinson? No, neither do I, Mrs. Rawlinson. But we intend to find out. A pleasure. Dirk, by the time I got there, the restaurant was closed. I, Dirk, I gently. Ah, Mrs. Sorskin, my oldest and, may I say, most valued client. Good day to you. Sadly, no sign as yet of young Roderick, I'm afraid. My theory is that your cat is not lost, but that his waveform has temporarily collapsed and must be restored, shrouding a plank and so on. Dead? Uh, but were that the case, should we allow black despair to hide from us the fairer light in which your blessed Moggy would now dwell? I think not. Besides, Roderick would be even more at peace if you paid some bill or other. Does that ring a bell with you at all? Come to think of it, there is that very bill I sent which has occasioned this delightful call. Sunday night, then, at 8.30. Till then. My dear Richard Macduff, your pizza. Uh, um, no thanks. I had breakfast. I told the restaurant you'd pop in and settle up over the weekend. Welcome, <laughs> sit down, the light works, the gravity works, anything else we'll have to take our chances with. Uh, right. <laughs> you seem to be extremely relaxed for a man in your position. Excuse me? Oh, good heavens, he hasn't got to you as well, has he? Who hasn't got to me? Gordon. No, well, obviously not. Gordon Way. He has this habit of trying to get people to bring pressure on me. Uh, never mind. What did you mean, then? Ah, Gordon Way had this habit, had he? Looks like he's just kicked it. Had? The body of Gordon Way was discovered in the remains of his country cottage this morning. What? He had been shot, strangled, and then his cottage was set on fire. <gasps> Given that shotgun pellets were found in his abandoned car three miles away, police think the body was moved afterwards. Furthermore, the doctor who examined the body is of the opinion that Mr. Way was strangled after he was shot, which seems to suggest a certain confusion in the mind of the killer. But what? By a startling coincidence, it appears that at around the time of death, traffic cameras show only one car on that stretch of road. That car belonged to a Mr. Richard Macduff. That's you, one of the two people most likely to benefit from Mr. Way's death, since Way Forward Technologies would almost certainly pass at least partly into his hands. The other person is his only living relative, Miss Susan Way, into whose flat Mr. Richard Macduff, that's also you, was observed to break last night. The police don't know that bit, of course, nor, if we can help it, will they. The radio reports say that they're urgently seeking Mr. Macduff, whom they would like to eliminate from their inquiries in a tone of voice that says he's clearly guilty as hell. My scale of charges is as follows. £200 a day plus expenses. Expenses are not negotiable and are all necessary eventually. Am I hired? I, I don't even know whether to believe you. May I use your phone? Please. Hello? Susan, it's Richard. Richard! Gordon's been murdered. Are you all right? Don't tell her where you are. I'm at Dirk Gentles. I went round to your flat. It's crawling with police. I was only there. Hang I... up. Susan, listen, I... Here. Hey! The police will have a trace on the line. But I have to tell them it wasn't me. Oh, well, that's you off the hook, then. Tell them it wasn't you. If only Dr. Crippin had thought of that, would have saved him so much bother getting hanged. Yes, but he was guilty. And so, it would appear at the moment, are you. I can't gather my thoughts. It's like trying to do calculus with someone kicking your head. What do you think I should do? Hypnotism. In episode one of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams, Harry Enfield played Dirk Gently, and Billy Boyd was Richard McDuff. Olivia Coleman was Janice Pierce, Felicity Montague, Susan Way, and Michael Fenton Stevens played Michael Wenton Weeks. Toby Longworth was the Electric Monk, Robert Duncan played Gordon Way, Jim Carter was Jilks, and Andrew Sachs played Professor Cronotis. Geoffrey Holland played George III, Wayne Forrester was the courtier, and John Glover was Professor Corley. Philip Pope was the garage attendant, and the newsreader was Neil Sleet. The announcer was John Marsh. The music was by Philip Pope. The programme was dramatised by Dirk Maggs and John Langdon. Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency was produced by Joe Wheeler and the director, Dirk Maggs, and was an above-the-title production for BBC Radio 4.
That was the first episode as it was broadcasted on October 3, 2007 on BBC4. The second episode was broadcasted on October 10, 2007. There is a teaspoon in the metronome, a salt cellar in the earthenware and a horse in the bathroom. Right. Morning, Detective Sergeant Jukes. Less of the chit-chat. Macduff's flat's on the second floor. Can't miss it. Turn left after you climbed over the sofa. Any sign of Macduff? I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> yeah, apparently one of our actually saw him last night, stopped him, right, and get this. <laughs> he only let him... <coughs> It was you, wouldn't it, Sarge? <clears throat> so, uh, what's he look like? Not the sort of bloke who'd shoot Gordon Way, drag the body three miles, then strangle it, stuff it in the cupboard and blow up the whole cottage for a grand finale. Tall? Short? See that Greek restaurant down the road? The bloke in the phone box? Which reminds me, I need to talk to the RSPCA. My mobile's flat. You got yours? Uh, not with me. RSPCA? <laughs> Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams Sorry, I had to. I was at Dirk Gently's. What? Speak up. I can't hear you. I was with a private detective. Someone I knew at Cambridge. Bit of a shady character, really. Richard, what is going on? I'm in the phone box outside my flat, and you were right. The place is crawling with police. They think you killed Gordon. I've already told them you couldn't have done it. I mean, they've got to believe the victim's sister, haven't they? But you must talk to them. I can't. Dirk says it's better to... Oh. Excuse me, sir. Will you be long? <laughs> Sir! Dolmades! What? What? Souvlaki. A small Greek sausage, madam. Very tasty. Are you mad? This is your establishment here, sir. Yes. Restaurant phone bust. Uh, yes, lady. Is party of 42? Starter for person number one. Oh, um, calamari. Uh, medium rare? Over easy? Ah, okay. Uh, person number two. Oh, never mind. He's gone. Sorry, Susan. Had to think fast. It was the policeman who stopped me last night. Did he recognise you? Kept my head down. Look, can you think of anyone who had a grudge against Gordon? Who'd want him dead? How long have you got? Oh, great. Michael went in weeks for a start. Wednesday week? But he was with you last night. Mind you, he was behaving very oddly. And you weren't. Breaking into my flat? True. Was he with you the whole evening? Every thrill-packed minute, moaning about how his life was ruined thanks to Gordon and his mother. Did he mention a monk? He did to me. Excuse me? Never mind. Look, I think I'll have to do this Dirk's way. No, no, but, but Richard! I'll call you back. Now, Mr. Wenton Weeks, yes. do lie down. Right. When you're comfortable, tell me where you'd like to start this week. My mother hates me. I'm sure she's trying to destroy me. I see. I was rather hoping we'd break new ground. Right. Well, um, I'm almost certain I'm being followed by a monk on horseback from outer space. Right. Um, let's go back to your mother, shall we? The BBC economics editor, Davis Evans. The shockwaves through the world's financial market... Can't believe it. He was here last night. ...of the murder of Gordon Way. Nice enough blow. Lovely car. Quiet evening, too. Well, except for this weird priest bloke who was hanging around. Hang on, Jeff. He's back. I'll catch up later. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I believe you can help me. OK. You want to say something? I am happy to believe that, too. And I will say something. You have the television on while you are working. But no video recorder? Uh, no. Well, you can relax now. I was watching you yesterday, but I had instructions, so I had to find a way to fulfill them. Now, however, I am able to take over. You may go back to your work. I am working. Take over what? Watching the television. You are? 
Have you heard of a labour-saving device? What, like a dishwasher? Yes, yes, like a dishwasher. Dishwashers wash tedious dishes for you, thus saving you the bother of washing them yourself. Video recorders watch tedious television for you, leaving you free to listen to the radio or otherwise enjoy life. Uh, w well... In the absence of a video recorder, I can take over the tedious business of watching your television. I am an electric monk. Ah, you're a wind-up. Jeff hired you. I can save you the bother of believing he did. Electric monks are labour-saving devices. We save you the onerous task of believing all the myriad tiny things that you are daily called upon to sift for veracity. Right, that does yes. it. Out. Yes, out. I believe. Out. I believe out. I am being thrown out yes. and that you are yes. propelling me to the door. Yes. Yes. And stay out! I believe I'm outside now. The phone's ringing, Mr Gently. Answer it, please, Miss Pierce. Pay me and I will, Mr Gently. Oh. Dirk Gently's holistic... Sod off! I hope that wasn't a customer, Miss Pierce. You'll never know. Hi, Janice. Me again. Retro McDuff. I urgently need you to... You better ask someone who works here, Mr McDuff. Show him in, Miss Pierce. <clears throat> Show him in yourself! Oh, <laughs> I'll do it. Richard, I've been expecting you. I'd offer you coffee, but Miss Pierce isn't here. Perhaps you'd decide to be once I've been to the bank. Huh. Dirk, listen. I'm in terrible tr... God, it's dark in here. I know. Right. Anyway, the police are all over my flat. Figures? I think they're armed. Hard to tell what's under those flak jackets. Mostly it's lunch. What shall I do? I suggested a course of action. Hypnotism? Important information could be jumbled up in your head that might never emerge because you're not realising its significance. With your permission, we can shortcut all that. Yes, OK. Good. Let's start. What? This minute? And relax. Completely relaxed. And keep looking at this metronome. That's a spoon. Not this spoon. That spoon tied to the metronome. Totally relaxed. Feeling sleepy. Eyelids heavy. Very sleepy. Deep sleep. Listening to my voice. Miss Pierce! Coming! Deep sleep. Pen notebook! Taking you back now. Notebook. Resignation letter. Will this take long? Not in the hands of an expert. Well, that's an early finish out the window then. Richard, I'm taking you back to last night. You attended a dinner at St. Seth's College, Cambridge. Yes. I want you to describe exactly what happens in the dining hall. What you see. What you smell. Boiled carrots and furniture polish. Where are you sitting? At high table with my old professor. Who is? Urban Chronotis, Regius Professor of Chronology. Wow, you can do this. Only with two-legged clients, so far. You can hear the professor over the hubbub quite distinctly. Yes, he's speaking. I gather, young Macduff, you've done rather well for yourself at last. Hmm? It's all relative, Professor Cronotus. No, no, Reg, I insist. Reg, it's more accurate to say I've done rather well for way forward computers. Did you say computers? I'm so pleased for you. Here, <clears throat> have some salt. Uh, I think I'll wait for the food. Any idea what we're having? Oh, to the last molecule, dear boy. Imagine the finest, most delightful meal you've ever tasted. Yeah? Hold that thought. It'll sustain you through the horrors of what you're about to eat. Luckily for me, I'm not hungry. Now, take the salt before you're killed in the rush. Here. Good grief. It just... Disappeared? We can see that. <laughs> or can we? It was in your hand. No, not bad for an old, increasingly arthritic hand. But where is it? Here, where it always is. Behind Professor Corley's ear. See? <laughs> not again, <laughs> uh, I have absolutely no idea how you did that. Or why? Oh, I'm sorry, Corley. Irritating habit, I know. Reg, hmm? there's a child here. Isn't that against protocol? Oh. Or is she the new maths professor? Oh, it is, uh, a Corley? Mm -hmm. uh, who does the little girl belong to? Oh, some chap they've invited from the BBC. Flew back today from holiday, came straight from the airport. 
daughter had to come with, poor child. Well, she looks utterly bored, so she's joined in the general spirit, at least. Hello. I'm not surprised. They've given some old jug to play with and ignore it. Now, the girl found the pot in Greece. I think father was looking for a free valuation. Having the heart to tell him some Peloponnesian potter threw hundreds of the things in 500 BC. Antiquity does not automatically confer value. Or, as you'll have found, Cronotis, good taste. Uh. Oh, yes, yes, quite true. <laughs> um, see that brick, Richard? Hmm? Wordsworth was once sick on that brick. Great man, but you wouldn't get tuppence for the brick. Don't leave so for us. Doc uh, Leaf Soup, Professor. Oh, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Doc Leaf Soup, sir. Mm. Oh, thank you. Are the dock leaves fresh? Oh, yes, sir. It says so on the tin. Hmm. Not exactly a taste explosion, is it? It's, uh, different. Oh, hardly. We have it every time. We have it every time. So you eat it? I'm hungry. Your appetite is good, because at this stage you have no thoughts of murder, do you? I could murder a sandwich. Tell me more about your work. You what? Tell me more about your work, my dear. Is he talking to me? He's still regretting. Write this down. Uh, tell me more about your work, my dear chap. Well, my real passions were computers and music. I see. I thought I could make a career out of music. When I finally came to my senses, I got into programming computers. Oh. I spent weeks teaching a prehistoric laptop to play three blind mice. <laughs> but what we called a computer back then was pretty primitive. Little more than an electric abacus. Oh, don't underestimate the abacus. It's a remarkably sophisticated calculating device. <laughs> Fair point. There wasn't a lot this machine could do that I couldn't do myself in half the time. Ah. But it was very good at being a slow and dim-witted pupil. <laughs> they are hardly in short supply, eh? I could hit a dozen from here with this bread roll. Uh, ooh, do some damage, too. <laughs> I mean that programming is like explaining something complex to someone slow and dim-witted. You have to break things down to their building blocks. In doing so, the teacher can end up learning more than the pupil. It would be hard to learn less than my pupils without undergoing a prefrontal lobotomy. <laughs> yes, and, and um, as a result of this... You found yourself working for Gordon Way of WayForward Computers. Gordon read a magazine article I wrote about my work. He wanted to reinvent the wheel. Hmm. The, what? In computer terms, reinvent accountancy software. That's where the money is. Literally. OK, Richard. I read your piece in Fathom. Here's what I want. The guys and dolls of all accounts programs. The West Side Story of business spreadsheets. Bill Gates meets Steve Jobs on Broadway wearing pink spandex. Um, uh, I'm sorry? According to you, the building blocks of nature, the way the plants grow, mountains erode, or rivers flow, are fractals. Basic patterns that get complex as they are enlarged. And the closest humans come to expressing these complexities is through music. Yes, it's the most abstract of the arts. It has no purpose other than to be itself. But... If music is a way of expressing mathematical data and nature balances itself through the interaction of fractals, with accountancy being essentially the balancing of mathematical data... Any set of accounts is, in the end, a pattern of numbers balanced through the interaction of simple rules, like fractals, like music. Exactly! And that's what I want! An all-singing, all-dancing spreadsheet application like no other. But there are hundreds of spreadsheet apps packed with features, bar graphs, pie charts... Sock charts! I want the pie flung out of the screen into my face! I want bar graphs so plush they're upholstered in button leather! A user interface so intuitive it reads my thoughts before I thunk them! Graphics that make the Mona Lisa look like a daub in chimpanzee poo! Accountancy software that sings! I need better than that! I need bloody genius! Richard... I don't want the competitors to worry when they see this. I want them to hemorrhage. OK, Gordon. I'll give it a go. Hemorrhage? The computer business is cutthroat, and Gordon was dealing in dodgy software when every other 12-year-old was dealing playground pogs. But if you reduce music to mechanical maths, where does the emotion come into it? The shape of a flower. The way a baby grows. The last chord of a symphony. All can be described by the complex flow of numbers. That's the beauty of it. That's what I demonstrate to Gordon. OK, Richard, it's crunch time. Anthem will take your company accounts and um, express them as fractal waveforms. Anthem, fractals. I'm loving the way you're talking. So, here's WayForward's annual report expressed as a conventional spreadsheet. 
Yes, right, traditionally rows of numbers, lots of cells, unintelligible interface. Here's the same data interpreted by Anthem. It's Mozart! Not exactly! Like it? The graphics, that bar graph's like something by Pixar, Richard, I'm totally rotting this idea. Show me another! Okay, um, let's take the UK's balance of payments for the last five years. Disney! Look at the curves of that! How do I know you're not just inventing this? OK. Uh, by way of contrast, here's my tax return for the last fiscal year. All right, all right, make it stop! Sorry. I'm a dreadful bookkeeper. Oh, well, we've got to put this in front of marketing. Richard. Let's get back to last night, the Coleridge dinner at St. Seds. Mm. You've just told Professor Cronotis about Anthem. What happens now? He's doing another magic trick. Is he? You're still watching? Yes. Reg notices how bored the little girl has become. So he goes and fetches a hat and says... Young lady, regard this simple salt cellar. Regard this simple hat. Then he puts the salt cellar in the hat. And it disappears. And there's a kind of chill that goes through. Hang on. Does it reappear? The salt cellar? Yes. In the Greek pot, belonging to the little girl. Reg asks permission to smash it. And there's the salt cellar. Impressive trick. He put it there. He couldn't. The hole in the pot is too small. Hmm. A plant. A pot plant? The little girl was a plant. In on the trick, or... No. Does she seem to know Reg well? Not at all. But ever since he's come back with the hat, he's been sort of flushed and quiet. I ask him if he's all right. Uh, m- me? Yes. Yeah, I'm just, just a bit peckish. Well, I thought you weren't hungry. Uh, uh, what, what, wasn't I? Gentlemen, box over in Shandy on a bed of roasted grapes. Oh, so it is. Mm. Oh, quite extraordinary. Well, in the end, you know, Anthem's just maths. No, I, I mean the liver. Pray silence for the provost. As tradition demands, I shall recite the noble text from memory. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where out the sacred river ran, through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. And this is when they start the Coleridge reading. The what? Samuel Taylor Coleridge, early 19th century poet and laudanum addict. A junky poet? It's an annual dinner in his honour. Ah. And no, I won't organise one here so you can roll spliffs in the office and knock out dirty limericks on the back of unpaid invoices. How did you... Richard, what's happening now? The provost gets to the second part of the poem. The part where it gets really weird. To Asgard, where Odin's son quells the rhinoceros. And lo... He stays his hammer. Reg. Mm, sorry. How much longer do you think this goes on for? Oh, God knows. It's one of the longest poems in English literature. One begins to see the appeal of laudanum. Just, I have to drive back to London tonight. You leave? No. I promise Reg I'll have a drink with him afterwards. So we go back to his room. See if you can find the sofa. It's probably under something. <laughs> oh, sit on it if you can. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you'll manage it. It always feels to me as if it's been stuffed with cabbage leaves and cutlery. <laughs> uh, do, do you have a good sofa? I have, but I've never sat on it. Oh. Not that I wouldn't like to. It's stuck halfway up the stairs to my flat. The delivery men got it jammed trying to turn it in the stairwell. It won't budge either way. I'm trying to solve the problem using computers. Ah, computers again, yes. Uh, uh, so, what about the rest of your life, young MacDuff? Are you married? Well, no, not married as such, but yes, there is a specific girl that I'm not married to. Is she a computer bot as well? Professional cellist. In fact, she's also Gordon's sister. I'm not sure Susan really approves of computers that much. She hangs around a lot with this literary type. Total nutter. Actually, you might remember him. Contemporary of mine, Michael Wenton Weeks. Mm, a few months ago, he asked me to join the board of his wretched magazine. Huh? What's it called? Fathom. He published my article about fractals in Fathom. Said he didn't understand it. Uh, Fathom, that's it. His mother's uh, Lady... Uh, what's her name? She's always on the phone. Wants to build a college and new library. Lady Magna. She's just sold Fathom. Oh? To Gordon Way, of all people. I don't even think Michael knows yet. 
He must by now. It's been all over the financial pages. Now, Michael, darling. Yes, mother. How shall I talk to you? As my son or as the former editor of Fathom? Well, Close your mouth, please. We've lost pianos that way. What do you mean, former editor? I'm so glad that's out of the way. Now, look at these figures. The ones on the right are your reports for the incomings and outgoings of Fathom. Yeah. The ones on the left show the actual figures. So, that's all perfectly satisfactory, then. Oh, don't you want to hear what I've... Darling, I'd sooner shut my nipple in a car door. I'm sure the new owner of Fathom will be glad to listen to whatever it is. What? You're actually selling Fathom? I've already sold it. Who have you sold it to? Gordon Huey. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mother. I won't let you get away with this. That's exactly what Gordon said when I showed him these figures. Now, darling, I can see your trouble by this. Don't you have an appointment? You haven't heard the last of this. Is he all right? Seems to have drifted off. It's quite normal, I hope. Now, Richard. Richard? Richard! Shh! Richard. I'm listening. Have you left the professor's living room? Fat chance. He's making tea now. I want you to tell me what you see. There's a navicus on the table, very old, very well used, and a book. Do you look at it? I pick it up. It's a guide to the Greek islands. Is it now? And a piece of paper falls out of it. It says, regard the silver salt cellar, regard the simple hat. Rich has written down the words he was going to say to the little girl. Yes. How could he know she'd be at the dinner? Indeed. And then, Richard? Yes, please. What? Reg is asking if I want milk. One lump or two? Uh, one, please. Sugar? Uh, sorry, there was a... Um, I dropped your bookmark. Uh, uh, what were you saying? The sugar. Just a tiny joke of mine to see if people are listening. <laughs> Reg just hurled the tray onto the floor. He looks panicked. I don't know what's got into him. Go on. I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, uh, glass of port instead? No, thanks. Do you need a doctor? No, I'm fine, perfectly well. I, I thought I heard a... Well, the noise startled me. It was nothing. <laughs> Overcome with the tea fumes, I expect. I'm, I'm sorry, I must catch my breath. Uh, what kind of noise? Uh, that. <laughs> Did you hear it? Yes. It seems to be coming from above the kitchen. Is there someone up there? Nobody that should be there. Then... I must go up. I must. Please, wait for me here. What if it's a burglar? Listen, I'll go. I'm sure it's nothing. It's just the wind or something. Stand aside, Macduff. It is for me to do. When I come back down these stairs, if my behaviour strikes you as being odd in any way, if I appear to be not myself, then you must stop me and wrestle me to the ground. Do you understand? At all costs, you must prevent me from doing anything. But how will I know? Sorry, that came out wrong. But how do I know... You will know. You must wait for me here. Mm. Freezing in here. It's all right. It's just a horse in the bathroom. That's not enough for me. What? You, oh, get off! You wouldn't let me go! Did I'm all right? It's just a horse, a perfectly ordinary horse. Oh, oh, oh but yes. Thank you for taking me at my word. A horse? I don't understand what any of this means, but I'm going to find out. What can you see? Tell me exactly. Um, a bathroom. Not very large. Panelled in oak linen fold. Uh, the other fittings are pretty institutional. Scuffed black and white lino. Enamel bath. Chipped, but clean. Small basin with a toothbrush and toothpaste in a glass. Lavatory with original chain pool system. A cream-painted wooden cupboard in the corner with an old bent wood chair next to it. And a large horse. <laughs> oh, good girl. Stay. As you will. As you will. OK, according to all my five senses, you do seem to have a horse in your bathroom. And is that port still on offer? <laughs> Yes, a good thing your friend didn't come along after all. Friend? Well, you came alone. Ah, Susan, I've really got to go. Can I borrow your phone? No, oh, certainly, yes, if you can find it. Don't you find losing your phone 
And convenient? Oh, not really. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, Mr. McDuff, isn't it? You remember? All porters never forget the young gentleman, sir. Even when we try. Hey, good night, you, sir. Uh, look, is there a... a horse anywhere in the college? I mean, you would know if there was, wouldn't you? No. And yes, I would, sir. Thanks. Dear, oh dear. Oh, here's your brew, Bill. Thanks. You can say what you like about people. I don't get any less peculiar. A fella just now asked if there was a horse in the college. Yeah? Well, I had a bloke in the lodge earlier. Well, or a priest. He seemed happy just to stand by the fire and listen to the radio. Oh, blooming nerve. Standing in front of your fire like that. In the end, I told him to shoot off. Didn't want to use language. You know. <laughs> and this priest says... Is that really what I must do? Shoot off. And I said, yes, shoot off. And he just looked me straight in the eyes and he said that he believed me. <laughs> Foreigners. I only mentioned it because he also said he left his horse in the washroom and could I see it was all right for hay? Excellent, Richard. Mm. Now you will wake up on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh. And wide awake. Mm. Near enough? Uh, oh, oh. Any help? No, oh, I'd say so, wouldn't you, Miss Pierce? He could have been making it up. Oh, what? How could he know about that last bit? What last bit? That stuff with the porters and the priests. He'd left by then. Well, no, I, I was just outside looking for my car keys. I overheard them. Oh. Oh, oh! What? I just remembered what else I saw last night. Just before the policemen arrived. Oh, I'm getting shivers again. I saw Gordon in the road flagging me down. What time was this? Ten o'clock. I checked my watch because I thought Susan might have gone to bed. You saw a ghost. Time of death was estimated at 9 to 9.30. Come on. Where are we going? To visit the scene of the crime. In episode two of Dirk Gently's Solistic Detective Agency by Douglas Adams, Harry Enfield played Dirk Gently and Billy Boyd was Richard McDuff. Olivia Coleman was Janice Pierce, Felicity Montague, Susan Way, and Michael Fenton Stevens played Michael Wenton Weeks. Toby Longworth was the Electric Monk, Robert Duncan played Gordon Way, Jim Carter was Jilks, and Andrew Sachs played Professor Cronotis. Tamsin Heatley was Lady Magna, and Andy Seacombe the Psychiatrist. John Glover played Professor Corley. Philip Pope was the Garage Attendant, and Neil Sleet played the Newsreader. The announcer was John Marsh. The music was by Philip Pope. The programme was dramatised by Dirk Maggs and John Langdon. Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency was produced by Joe Wheeler and the director Dirk Maggs and was an above-the-title production for BBC Radio 4. That was the second episode of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. We will continue on with the rest of the series in tomorrow's episode, so stay tuned. Airchecks is a three-hour podcast that is cut down to one-hour increments and uploaded every Saturday and Sunday. See you on the same time and the same channel.